The prison population in the United States has surged over the past three decades. Although there's been a slight reduction in the past year, more than two million people are incarcerated, either in prison or in jail awaiting trial. 743 Americans are incarcerated per 100,000 of population. That means the U.S. is the highest rate of imprisonment in the world. In fact, no other country approaches American prisons. One explanation for the boom in the prison population is the mandatory sentencing imposed for drug offenses and the tough-on-crime attitude that's prevailed since the 1980s. But it's the length of the sentences that truly distinguishes American prison policy. Some prisoners are locked up for life, literally. Many receive harsh sentences for nonviolent crimes. The long sentences lead to overcrowding, which in turn leads to the building of new jails. Nearly 40% of America's prison population is African American. That's despite blacks making up only 12% of the total U.S. population. In fact, a black male is seven times more likely to be in prison than a white male. More and more of the prison population are aging as long sentences are imposed. 8% are over the age of 55. This increases the burden for providing health care and geriatric services. And many prisoners report suffering from mental health issues and drug addiction. In California alone, it's believed around 50% of inmates need mental health treatment. So why does the United States have the highest rate of documented incarceration in the world? And does this policy work, or is it a rehabilitation policy, a better one? To answer this, we're joined from New York by Larry White, who's a community advocate for 14 Society, a group which promotes alternatives to incarceration. Larry himself spent more than 40 years here in Boston. Tracy Velasquez is here with me in the studio. She's the executive director of the Justice Policy Institute, and we're also joined by Charlie Sullivan from Citizens United for Rehabilitation of Errors, also known as CURE. Welcome to all of you. Thank to you. The program. Uh, you know, we look at those figures, they're very sobering figures. The United States has something like 5% of the world's population, but when you look at its prison population, it has a quarter of the world's prison population. I mean, let's try and put this into some kind of perspective. As we reported there, the United States has the highest documented incarceration rate in the world with 743 people in prison and jailed for every 100,000 residents. Now, Rwanda comes second with 595 per 100,000 behind bars. Russia is third with 568 per 100,000 in prison. China only has figures for prisoners who've been sentenced with 172 inmates for every 100,000 people. That's 71st on the list. But even if the estimated number of people in prison that are waiting trial are added, people still say figures are still lower than the United States. Tracy Velasquez, why the huge number in the U.S.? There's a number of reasons, uh, most having to do with the way we've changed policies over the past three decades. We've sentenced people longer for uh, mandatory minimums, three strikes laws. We have seen a huge increase in the number of people incarcerated for drug offenses in this country. And uh, um, uh, we also use prison as a sentence more than most other countries. Other countries will find other ways to hold people accountable. The U.S. chooses prison more than any other country. Larry White in New York, you've described the imprisonment of people in the United States as the new slavery. Explain that one. Uh, when you look at uh, the history of the, of, of the predominant number of people who are going to prison in the United States, you'll find there are people of color. Uh, when you look at right after slavery, and they, uh, they, they passed the 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment says there should be no slavery except for those who are convicted of a serious crime. What has happened since that time that the 13th Amendment came into effect and, uh, and people was, and slavery was ended, you find that there's a great deal of, uh, 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 of African American and, and Latino men and people of color generally who have been uh, going into our prison system and convicted of serious crimes. Uh, what that means, what that means, of course, is that uh, what that means, of course, is that uh, uh, once you're convicted of a crime in the United States, what we find is that have collateral consequences. If you are sentenced to say like five to ten years, you can go to jail and you serve the whole ten years and come out with the notion of, uh, of improving your life and, and, and living a law-abiding life. What you will find is that the opportunities to improve your life are practically nil. You have uh, 
what they call collateral consequences of having been convicted of a crime and served time. So you'll find that when you apply for a job, for employment, for housing, even for college, you have to notate whether or not you've been convicted of a crime. If you've been convicted of a crime, you generally fall to the bottom of that list. Uh, I say it's slavery because prison has become the modern day slavery. There's a whole caste of people we have in this country who have been convicted of crime and, and, and have what I call a mark of the beast. Once you've had that, that conviction, it, it, it stops all, chan- all your life chances have been reduced. Okay. Your ability to improve the quality of your life. All right, good. Let's uh, pass these five seconds over to Mark Cooper. Uh, Larry talks uh, about uh, collateral consequences of people still being punished, even after they've served their sentences and go out into the world. They can't get jobs. Um, they can't basically reincorporate into the communities they came from. Uh, to what extent does, you know, does the problem start even before they go to prison? You know, is it when you look at the communities they come from, most of the prison population, and uh, you know, there are some who would say, look, if the high number of Hispanics and blacks are in prison, well, it's because the high number of, prison, uh, of blacks and Hispanics commit crimes. Well, I think statistically uh, we, that is not true. Uh, uh, you, you see that the crime rate is pretty much uh, across the board. It's just that the people of color are actually incarcerated more. That's where the police presence is, usually in the inner city. So you have more people going arrested and going to prison, but the crime rate, I think, statistically is about the same across the board. Um, also, we started in Texas, and uh, there's an old saying among the prisoners in Texas that you're, you're guilty until proven rich, and I think that's true. I think that uh, uh, usually the people are white, people are able to hire a better attorney or even many people of color will end up with a court-appointed attorney. And so uh, you're able to, in a, in a sense, buy your way out of the system if you are in the majority. Um, and that would be my whole life of the Larry. Chris, to what extent uh, has the mandatory sentences for drug offenders also the easy availability of guns? To what extent does that have to do with the high prison population? Well, the, um, I wanted to sort of occupy a little bit on to what Polly was saying, too, first, and that was around the issue of, of the communities of color and the way that the criminal justice system treats them. It really goes all the way back to when they're kids. If you look at the schools they go to, the schools that have a lot of police in them, the schools where children tend to get a second chance, by having plenty of adults who... Yes, but I find out there's collateral right. consequences that start right. before they go. They start before even, and it starts to how, you, how, de- how different children are treated in different communities that leads to their being involved in the justice system. And I just wanted to point out that it's, it's how kids get pushed out of schools, they get pushed into sort of what's becoming a, sub- a civil prison pipeline is a big piece of it, too. In terms of the, of the drug sentences, uh, it goes back to Charlie's point about the addiction, about do are there different rates of... of offenses of different rates of crime. We know from data, national data, that around drug use, that people use drugs at roughly the same rate for different ethnicities and different races. And yet, the number of African Americans and Latinos who end up in prison for drug charges is much higher. Obviously, we don't have data on all other sorts of offenses, but when you just look at drugs, you can clearly see that the way that we have uh, uh, treated drugs, drugs and criminalized addiction really has impacted some communities more than others. Okay. Larry White, what is the connection between the rising prison population and the current economic downturn that we're uh, experiencing right now? I don't know. I don't know the degree to which the prison population, you know, uh, has a direct effect on on, on the economy in this particular country. And I'm aware that... uh, you know, there, there seems to be two trends in, in, in terms of prisons that's taking place in the United States. There's the growth of the private prison, you know, and of course they, 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 they raise uh, their own particular issues why prisons should be private institutions and how they address immigration issues and all that. But you also find I, I want to get to that issue. Of, uh, Larry, I want to get to that issue of private prisons in just a moment. But uh, what I was looking at was, you know, are there more people committing crimes right now because there are more people jobless, because the, the economy has taken a downturn? 
you know, there's always there's always a connection between between economic conditions and crime itself. Uh, downward turn in economics is crime generative. I mean, these these are factors that that, that lead to crime. Uh, when people find themselves in desperate straits, they do desperate things. You know, and that leads to crime. So there's always a connection between the economy and and, and crime. Sure. Although the the figures actually show overall that violent crime and property crime are down over the past well we've been down for a while so it is kind of a little bit confusing it maybe has something to do with who's impacted more than than others I mean sort of the upside of if there is an upside to the economic downturn is that uh, states and uh, um, local governments are starting to look at the high cost of incarceration and look at how to reduce incarceration because it is so expensive so let me just sort of say that because from 2008 to now, uh, there has been less violent crime. In fact, violent crime has dropped by something like 25%. Mm -hmm. But I think, too, that there is some hope, and I think programs like Tools for Society have been around for many, many years mm -hmm. in providing uh, help, the reentry movement, where it's, it used to be, uh, and Larry can talk about, where you would come out of prison with a few dollars, and really no one can meet you at the gate. Today, uh, there is a lot of movement to help people when they return back to society. So I think these uh, movements, and there is, besides the reentry movement, as Stacy says, there's less incarceration, there's a move to alternatives. Uh, and so we're seeing, uh, the, I think, the reason that uh, uh, the crime rate is down in the midst of this high unemployment uh, is that there is a movement going on, a prison reform movement, but it includes reentry, includes a, a decrease in the prisoner population, includes uh, evidence-based programs, which I think are very important things that work. We're seeing now, uh, and and we're utilizing them. I mean, communities from New York City across the country are utilized. Here in Washington, I was a strategy at a program over in the east. Uh, southeast Washington, uh, where uh, there are very, very many uh, former prisoners there, uh, and they are doing, they had a reentry day where they were thanking all the people who are going the extra mile to help people uh, when they come back to the prison. They even honored, I thought it was so beautiful, they honored a barber who gave free haircuts to prisoners when they were coming back. I thought that's wonderful. And people were volunteering. In other words, today, I think, uh, and it has had an impact on the crime rate, that people are doing things to help the uh, offender when they come back into the community. Right. There is one other reason why the number of prisoners in the United States has decreased, and that is the whole question of overcrowding. I want to ask you about this, Stacey. In May 2010, the United States Supreme Court uh, ruled that California prisoners uh, – or California prisons, rather, were so right. overcrowded that they had to reduce the number of prisoners in California mm -hmm. uh, prisons. Now, to what extent has that changed uh, the number of prisoners? Well, what uh, it was interesting in California is the model that they used. Uh, instead of what I would have liked them to see is really address why so many people are incarcerated, they're sort of, um, you know, moving the uh, the pieces around on the board. They're moving more more people back to their county jails. Uh, rather than the state prison, without really addressing, I think, some of the root causes of why there's so many people in prison in California. There's sentencing, the fact that places like the L.A. County Jail hold so many people pretrial and they never get a chance to uh, be adequately defended. Um, you know, obviously there's some advantages to moving people locally. They may be closer to family and jobs and, and that might help with their reentry, but uh, you know, there's also some concerns. Some of these county jets are uh, not able to handle it. Some have talked about charging prisoners uh, a room and board. And uh, I think as we started to talk about a little bit, you know, to what extent is our private prison somehow going to be able to rope themselves into this issue to address uh, over-incarceration? Yeah, one of the arguments used in that case I was talking about was uh, whether overcrowding in prisons mm -hmm. uh, violates the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Mm -hmm. Now, that could be used across the country, couldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 certainly, yeah. And you talked earlier about private prisons, and I think that 
the whole and, and that is a threat to this reentry movement to a decrease in the prison population because as Larry pointed out too, I think the private prison movement is to keep more and more people locked up. Okay, and well let's let's yeah. just take a look at uh, the private pri the private prison situation here and the private prison situation here in the United States. Now there are more than 129,000 people who were in private prisons in 2009. That's compared to 87,000 in 2000. That's a 37% increase. Now, 8% of prisoners in the U.S. are now housed in private facilities. And in 2010, private prison companies spent more than $2 million in campaign funding for candidates at state level. That's 165% rise since 2002. They're also spending millions more lobbying legislators. Larry White, I want to address this to you. You know, we found that in one case, one of the biggest private prison companies in the United States, something known as uh, Correctional Corporation, uh, there was a lot, there was, it smacked of corruption in the way this company was set up because the, one of the co-founders was actually the uh, chairman of the Tennessee Republican Party, and he put forward this plan to build these private prisoners, uh, to build these private prisons, and now we have this burgeoning industry, s which some people refer to as the prison industrial complex. Uh, uh, prison, you know, prisons are affiliated with money today. You know, I mean, when you look at the kind of country that we live in, we live in a capitalist society. You know, and so they, they, they look at any booming industry here as, as a way of, of making money. Uh, you know, I, I, I really, you know, for me to, t to answer all these questions, we really got to go to the root problem of why do we select prisons to solve most of the problems that we call criminals. You know, crime is, is socially defined. People define what a crime is. How we approach crime really boils down to how this country feels about punishment. You know, we try to punish every particular act that we feel is wrong. And so we load people up into our prison system. It's hard for people to even begin to think what kind of society we have if we didn't have any, any, any prisons at all. There are a number of ways we can deal with crime without locking them up. The rise in alternatives to incarceration programs shows that. In one sense, prisons are on a down climb, and on the other sense, they're going up. Private, private prisons is really trying to pull prisons back into the whole thing because people are looking for various ways of dealing with crime without sending them to prison. Yeah, and they're in the trunk of most of reform. And let's take a look at this excerpt from the 2005 annual report of the Corrections Corporation of America, the one that I was talking about which is the biggest private prison company in the U.S. And I'm quoting here from the report. It says the demand for our facilities and services could be adversely affected by the relaxation of enforcement efforts, leniency in conviction and sentencing practices. Any changes with respect to drugs and controlled substances or illegal immigration could affect the number of persons arrested, convicted, and sentenced, thereby potentially reducing demand for correctional facilities to house them. And, of course, what it also reduces is the amount of money you're going to put in our pockets at the end of the financial year. So, yeah. I mean, this is a bit of, it's cynical, isn't it, the way we look at this? Uh, and let me I mean, just point out our organization. Uh, I'll, I'll come to you in a moment, Larry. Yeah, it's, I just want to make the point that we're not against privatization per se uh, in regards to connected with prisons. We feel the private sector ought to provide employable skills, good, sk good jobs and good wages. And I would see you see that prisoners could belong to unions, so that when they would come out, they would be able to go to the union hall and be able to have a job, et cetera. So we're not necessarily saying all privatization uh, is wrong. Yeah, but what this is saying is they shouldn't run the prison. Yeah, but what this is saying is, hey, you guys are also imprisoning more people. Otherwise right. We're, we're, we're totally opposed to that. Yeah. But the private sector has a role in regards to in providing employable skills. And, and there are some very good programs. Uh, I don't know if they're in New York, but certainly in a lot of places, usually the unions are very much against it. We've got to get the unions on board. The unions have been missing in the reentry movement, well, in my opinion. It's a, I think it's a fine line, though, it's between, a fine between, line. between yes. prisoners, people who are incarcerated, being used for basically slave labor at some point. Well, we're not talking about so slave labor. I, I mean, it could be. The potential is there. But I think employable skills, we're talking about where the private sector can go in and train prisoners. And I 
Absolutely. But I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering, and Chris, you may be able to mm-hmm. this, but what is the what is the motivation for these companies to unionize their business and everything? So because they are using slave labor right now, and they're making a lot of money out of it. Well, it's uh, it's interesting because there is definitely a need for people to leave, uh, who are incarcerated, to leave with the skills to be successful in life there. That means education. That means job skills. But when it becomes basically like a, like a labor camp, that's when you have concerns. Then it's really just kicking up trash. Okay. So, um, and in terms of the, the private prisons, what we've seen is that you know they will make a buck any way they can. I mean, they make a buck over the telephone. They make a buck on the commissary. They any any money that they can extract from prisoners and make from prisoners helps their bottom line. Uh, Florida's looking again to privatize 29 prisons. We just had a, a report come out from the Institute of Money and State Politics. Uh, the private prison spent over almost a million dollars just in 2010 alone on uh, political campaigns in Florida, where they're looking at privatizing. Has the Florida of it being blocked by the courts yet? Well, there's a new bill in the Senate right now, which is waiting to be heard on the Senate floor, that would revive that and would would again put forth legislation to privatize 29 prisons. Okay, let's go to Larry Love. Larry, you wanted to say something. Yeah, uh, we were talking about how private prisons were talking about uh, passing more laws and procedures that would uh, that essentially uh, shunt people into the prison system. You know, I think that what we really got to look at, you know, a lot of us seem to think that prisons really solve problems. There's a deep and in, in abiding belief in a whole lot of people, even so-called liberals, that prisons solve problems, you know. I mean, what we've got to realize is this, is we, we have to diminish the use of punishment, all right, and increase the use of evidence-based programs that shows changes in a person's behavior and cognitive thinking and so that it leads to law-abiding conduct. Those kind of things can be best addressed in the community. I mean, our, our highest econ- you know, academics in this country tell us that. I don't know why we keep lock, locking into the fact that prisons can help people. You know, that we send people to rehabilitate them. You know, I mean, that's that traditional approach. A person commits a crime, and what they say, oh, that person is evil, that person is wrong. People don't live in a vacuum, all right? They live in a world. And in that world, there are social, economic, and political consequences. You know, these are the things that surround people and that they, they react to. They shape people's behavior and how they think about certain things. We don't address that. We just address the individual. We don't address the social conditions in which they live in. You know? That's what prison does. Prison doesn't address the, the economic or the social or the, or, or the surrounding circumstances that, 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 that really have a great deal to do with whether that person goes to jail or not and whether they commit a crime or not. People okay. just don't commit a crime because it's something they thought last night. Well, as rude as the form says, I mean, you know, we've got a serious problem here in the United States, and it doesn't even feature on anybody's election agenda. Right. Not even the president of the United States has been talking about it. Right. I mean, I, I think particularly, uh, and it, and it's strange, we had a Republican governor in, in Mississippi actually uh, do some very controversial pardons. He really brought some to has always been a role historically in this country, and he's brought that, it back. That Haley Barber pardon. Uh, right, Haley Barber. I, I, I think the only thing President Obama has pardoned is, is Turkey, really, when you get right down to it. I haven't seen it, he. I think it's very minor crimes, uh, one or two people or whatever. So he really has not been a friend uh, in, in regard to clemency. Uh, so uh, I think we're... It's, it's uphill. Uh, I think it's also bipartisan. Let me say, too, I think Larry is, and I can certainly sympathize, mm-hmm. but I, he's talking about uh, being a, a prison abolitionist. Yes. I, I think I'm a prison reform, <laughs> but I can certainly sympathize with, with what he's saying. But I, I feel people are, we have 2.3 million people in prison, right. uh, and we ought to be providing employable skills. Ought to be teaching them how to use computers. Okay, Ken, thanks. 